Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Com Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, A-M-P-I-R-E. You should know that by now. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can read my work on ESPN.com. I have a story up now. I told you this yesterday. It's on Sam Howell, the growth that the team has seen in him, some very specific plays, especially against Baltimore, that I think showed them his ability to correct where he was at in his development and why they're pretty, why they feel good about their decision to start him. In a few minutes, I'm going to play you an interview I had with Jeremy Reeves a couple of days after the Browns game. So I referenced a couple of things in that Cleveland game in regards to Quan Martin, things that Jeremy maybe helped him with after that game. Feels like eons ago, but it really is only about a week ago. Anyway, but it's a good interview with Jeremy and just kind of where he's at with things and, and just the team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Good interview. Stay tuned for that in a few minutes, but I always have to get my little take in there on practice. So I wanted to go over some practice report stuff and just a few things where things stand. So let's start with it. We'll start with the practice today. It was not initially thought it was going to be a full padded practice. It was not. It was shells. Last practice open to fans. So a beautiful day. And we're talking low 70s. Very nice day. The, the turnout was the first time they had a weekend crowd, it was 10,000. Second time was eight, probably just a little bit under that second one, or, you know, certainly not above that, but a good crowd nonetheless. And one of the, some of the things that stand out with that is just what happens after practice. I'm going to point to a couple of guys in particular, but especially Terry McLaurin. And I'm starting with this because, you know, we sit there after practice and McLaurin signed autographs for about 45 minutes. And the reaction to him is tremendous. And this happens all the time. I can't say that he signed every day because it's hard to do that. Guys have other stuff to do. It's just really hard to spend that kind of time every day signing. But I'm not sure there's a guy on this team who understands their stature in this community, with this team, with this organization, with the fan base more than McLaurin. He wasn't the only guy out there signing. Brian Robinson does it a lot as well. Sam Howell was out there. Jeremy Reeves often does it too. There are a few other guys as well, but McLaurin consistently does this, as does as does Robinson, and they're very much in demand. I mean, with Terry, I mean, these are people that are screaming for him, screaming, screaming, you know, uh, little kids, uh, mothers, you know, older people, whatever. They all want a piece of him, and it's very hard to accommodate everybody. You could sign 40 autographs, and the 41st person in line is going to feel disappointed because you turn to go to the other side where there was another group of fans screaming for you. And the thing that when you're, when you're around Terry is just how engaging he is with people. I'm watching him today. I'm like, this is the last, this is like, I can't remember what day this is in camp, but we're on August 19th. They've had a lot of these open practices. He's signed a lot of autographs and yet it seems like it's the first time he's doing it. It seems like, you know, that it's, it's again, the first time he's very engaging. He feels very fresh and energetic. He sit, he sit there and talk to some kids about fishing, about whatever it is. But he's just, he's always, again, deeply appreciative of his stature. I think that speaks an awful lot about him. But that's how he's been the entire time he's been here. It's why I think this fan base loves him so much. In addition to the fact that he's very productive, it's also that he understands who he is, what he means, and he doesn't take it for granted. I can't say that about everybody here. And especially when it comes to the big name guys, McLaurin is by far the best one. That Robinson is right there. It's just that I think the demands for McLaurin are just a little bit different. But Robinson is always there as well. Other there are again there are a few other guys that do it. I just think for where Terry is with in with his stature and everything that it's pretty impressive with what he does. I mean I'm telling you today it's even on these hot days. And today wasn't exceptionally hot, but it was it was still you know it's warm. You're out there for they're out they're practicing for two hours. You've signed a lot. And and you do know that you're going to get swarmed by all these fans. And he's signing he's signing his cereal boxes, um, but he still does it. And again, it's it's just amazing to me how fresh he is. Because some guys will do it, they'll sign, and that's fine. There's not, nothing wrong with that. But McLaurin does it, and it's like I think the people will remember that encounter because of who and how he he is. And I just I think it needs to be said. All right, so let's turn to on the field. <clears throat> oh, by the way. You know, <laughs> 
one of the things that was funny, Nikki Javala tweeted a couple of these pictures, but Jeremy Reeves and McLaurin both signed. Some fans brought in the buy Dan beer cans. I would have, I had, was there for the picture. My phone died. Nikki got it, tweeted it out. They both signed the buy Dan beer cans anyway. And it, never mind. That's, that's all we'll go on there. No need to rehash all that. Anyway, let's get on the field. Don't know yet how much the starters are going to play against the Ravens on Monday night. <clears throat> um, Rivera said they're going to meet with that today, and then they'll they'll know that tomorrow and whatever. Um, what we do know is like Chase Young did not practice again today. He went through individual drills. Can't imagine him being out there. Logan Thomas working on a side field. Obviously, he wouldn't be out there. Some of the guys I wonder, like Kendall Fuller, did not practice again today. Not quite sure what's wrong with him. I have some – there are a couple of things I think it is, but I'm not going to say what I think it's. I will only tell you when I know what it, what, what it is um, anyway, but he wasn't out there again and he did not play against the, the Browns last week. So clearly there's something that where they just want to make sure that he's fully hundred percent before the season uh, gets going. Then you have Andrew Wiley has a little bit of a calf issue. He was out there today. Charles Leno went through some individual group and group stuff but not the full team work for Darian Mathis, still not out there. Danny Johnson was running on a side field. The good thing for him is that for his shoulder injury, after the body slam by Mark Andrews, again, like, I'll be honest, man, if I, I'll be curious to see what happens Monday night if, if, if he does play and just, you know, you don't want to see some cheap shot, but that was not a football play that he made. Anyway, but the, fortunately for Johnson, it's just – he has inflammation in his shoulder, so he's day-to-day. The inflammation just has to go down, and then he'll be able to get back out there. But re- suffice to say, he will not play on Monday night. Other things in practice. One of the things that I, I talked a little bit about this at one point, this this um, camp, but the running backs ran a lot, a lot, a lot of different pass routes this summer, and you saw that again today. Some of the stuff they're working on, some <laughs> some deeper outs, and just like the, working on stems and, you know, body fakes and making sure you keep your head straight as you're coming at the guy to make sure you can sell the fake. We saw like there, and I think some of the guys, these guys do this pretty well, but they have worked so much on route running this, this camp with the backs and even in the spring, but especially in camp that, it, you know, you really prepare to see them more involved in the pass game, you would think. But again, it's a different variety than it's what we've seen. It's not just the swings. And, you know, some little, you know, option routes over the middle. There are more legitimate routes down the seam, you know, maybe a corner route, something like that. And so it, a lot of it was just working on selling the fake, cutting, et cetera. And, you know, I think most of them seem to do a pretty good job. I think Robinson could be a big factor in that. Gibson, of course. Um, Chris Rodriguez, they felt, has caught the ball pretty well. And by the way, speaking of him, I think he's had a good camp as well. So, you know, um, I like the way he gets through the hole. I like the way he runs with power, lowers his shoulder at the end of his runs. And I think, he, again, and he'll even say this, that he catches better than people realize. <clears throat> a couple other things. Um, you haven't seen a lot of three linebacker sets out of camp, which is why when people talk about the depth and all that, you're not going to see a lot of three linebacker sets this season. One of the things, too, is you have to keep in mind they have so much versatility with the defensive backfield that gives them a lot of options this to what they can do. They can play a lot of dime if they want to. So you go four, one, six, you can play the, you can play seven defensive backs against a certain style of court. Like if you're playing Lamar Jackson in a regular season game, maybe use that more. I think that's what the Chargers did a few years ago in a playoff game. Hard way to fully go with that. Cause you need to be very physical with that, but they have that option. So it limits a little bit how much some of those backup linebackers would play. But again, today they did use some of those three linebacker sets. That third linebacker with the starters is David Mayo. And you shouldn't be surprised by that. And the reason I say that is coaches like him. And I think when you watch him play, the guy is really good against the run, really good against the run. He's also, this is separate from the scrimmage, but he's also a key special teams player. Like that guy is going to be on the roster. And, you know, I think the the hard part is in coverage, we see what he is in man. You can't have him in man coverage. In zone, he understands where to go, how to play zone, but in man, he just, that's, it's going to be a liability and he'll be exposed. So you, if he goes in the game, you have to make sure of what you're doing with your coverages, but the guy's had a good camp. He is a good run defender. And he, you know, the coaches, like I said, the coaches like him. I think when you're looking at that spot, it's interesting because typically they've kept five linebackers. I'm not sure that they keep five this time. I'm not sure they're going to be able to, 
but from the because of this one, I think Kalik Hudson would be your fourth linebacker. That, and then from there you got Milo Eifler, you got um, uh, Dijon Harris. So like those are guys that I think would be in the mix. But you can get those guys onto the practice squad. So I think it wouldn't shock me if you go four linebackers and keep maybe an extra defensive end or maybe an extra defensive back. And when you look at the defensive ends, like Andre Jones, to me, I don't know how you, I don't, it's hard to see him cutting him, but the interesting battle there will be with those DNs. So James Smith Williams, Casey Tuhill. It's very interesting what they're doing with Smith Williams this summer. And he got a lot of playing time last week, but also now they're working them inside in some of those rotations. It can, you can develop a speed rush that way. And that's a good thing. But it also, to me, it's like, are they trying to see more from him to see, like, is he, should he be kept around in this role? F.A. Obata does it. F.A. Obata is their top backup defensive end at this point. But with Smith Williams, can he show that ability to do that? Now, watching him today, again, just in shells, but he had one rush where he just got right past Ricky Stromberg, rookie right guard. Next rush, Stromberg did a better job of slowing him down. Um, but that quickness inside is what they would look for. So can he help them there? So maybe he'll, maybe that's what the kind of some of the role they'll play him in Monday night. But the, and I bring that up because they, I just can't see him cutting Jones at this point. But then do you keep KJ Henry as well? Because if you do, that's going to be 11 defensive linemen. And, but they, what they really want are young defensive linemen to develop Smith Williams, two Hill, both free agents. Of course, the starters, both free agents. And so it don't it wouldn't be shocked if if they went with four linebackers and perhaps um, eleven defensive linemen because that's you know you they I think they're going to be reluctant to get rid of some of those guys so and I think you know right now I don't I don't I think like I said I think Andre Jones would be on it just the way they're working who they're working him against clearly want to see more clearly intrigued to see what more can he handle et cetera so anyways just wanted to bring that up. <clears throat> um, you know, and then let's look at, uh, okay, Emmanuel Forbes. One thing, again, today's shells, but they were going pretty full go without the contact. And what you see with him always pops out is the length and the speed and the recovery. He has really good feet. And I think he, he had a couple of breakups today because of that. The other guy I want to talk about, Nick Gates. And it's funny because he's got, he's got this long flowing hair, always has his shirt pulled up, loves that big old belly he's got. And, you know, it's, it's, but he's got personality and he's, he's fun to talk to, but I think he's really good for that line. And I think one of the things that I think these coaches hope is the line gets to the point where they say, tired of hearing about it, tired of hearing about what everybody else says out here. And I think Gates offers them some of that after the, one of the Ravens practices, it was funny because we're talking to Gates and he said, you know, talking about the fights and all that, he's like, I'm a guy who likes to walk right up to that line, but then get the other guy to cross over it. So that's kind of his style, but he brings like, even Sam Cosby said, he brings the nastiness to them. And I think that's a, that's what they need. There's a, listen, they need more. We know they need some more up there, but the, the attitude and the demeanor can, can also be something they, they also need more depth. Right. But that's something I think just that attitude would be good for them to adopt. And speaking of Cosme, it's funny because he was asked about the uh, Ravens 24 game preseason win streak. And he said, it's a, basically called it it's a stupid record. Who gives a, who gives a bleep? Um, then he said, you know, we're going to break it. So there you go. So anyway, for whatever that's worth, we talked to Jacoby Brissett today. He kind of left yesterday for Sam Howell and Brissett handles things like a pro. I think he knew he's known for a while what the score was here. He knew that Howell was getting the job. What I, I don't know that he, I don't know if he felt like he never quite got a shot to do it. I think it was always clear going into this. I mean, we've, we've known, you've known for a long time. This was Jacoby, excuse me, <laughs> Jacoby. This was Howell's job to lose. And unless he's showing that he was losing a grip on it, Brissett just wasn't going to get a chance. But again, the dude's a true pro. And he's, he said, you know, he's not here. He, he even said, I'm not here to coach Howell, but he is here to be a good teammate. And he is, that's one of the things that coaches, and teammates really like and respect about him. And by the way, one of the things that during, even during these practices, it gets a little bit chippy and between some of the defensive guys and Brissett and Brissett was like, you know, he's I even at, he, he said, it's all in good fun, but it is something that, you know, you still get a lot of that. What he doesn't like is when they call him brisket. I don't think he likes that. 
Speaking of intensity, let's go back to offensive coordinator Eric Bieniemy. But this is where, you know, it's constant, constant, constant state of urgency or sense of urgency, and that's what he has. There was one time where there was a route where Gibson was supposed to turn to Gibson running. I think it must have been some sort of wheel route. I didn't see the beginning running down the right side, and Howell throws it down to him. I don't think Gibson was expecting it, so he wasn't going as hard for half the play, and it was incomplete. Afterwards, the enemy yelled to get another back in there, and he, he was um, yelled out. He took the play off. He wasn't happy. So anyway, just another lesson from the enemy. And then, but there was another time where Howell hits Marcus Kemp in the middle of the field on a little dig, and, and he was ecstatic about that. And he's like, that's what, that's what I'm talking about, right in the middle of the box. So there you go. And then speaking of Stromberg from earlier, worked at right guard and at center. So I don't, again, we'll find out tomorrow, Monday morning, whenever, who will or will not play, how much they'll play. And, you know, I think they, I think what they really felt good about is the two days of work. So do they feel like they need to get a ton from the starters? I don't know. I would also be careful with how, if you don't have your full complement of offensive linemen, and you're facing a couple of guys who can rush the passer. Do you really want to expose him to too much against the Ravens? So I think that's something to watch as well. All right, folks, that's it for me. I'll be back. It'll be Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning. Bram and I, Bram Weinstein, the voice of the commanders, and I will will discuss what happened in the game, what it means, because we're getting closer and closer to the final cut down. So that's it for me. Thanks. Oh, by the way, that's not it for me. I got Jeremy Reeves coming up. So stick around. You want to hear Jeremy Reeves, popular guy, good player, good in the locker room, good special teams player, all that stuff. So stay tuned for my conversation with Jeremy Reeves. NFL Sunday Ticket is now on YouTube and YouTube TV, which means that it just got easier to be an NFL fan, even if you live far away. Like maybe you like the Bears, but you're hibernating in Panthers territory. But with NFL Sunday Ticket, your out-of-market team is never more than a short distance away, specifically the distance from you to your remote control. NFL Sunday Ticket, now on YouTube and YouTube TV. Go to youtube.com slash presale to get $50 off. Terms and embargoes apply. Offer ends 919. No refund. Subscription auto renews. There is still time for one more family adventure this summer. The country's largest climbing and zipline park is open seven days a week until Labor Day. With eight different levels, 16 courses, 250 climbing obstacles, and over 4,000 feet of zip lines, the Adventure Park at Sandy Spring, located in Montgomery County, Maryland, is the perfect place to spend the last few days of summer. Once you're back on the ground, head over to Axe Throwing and try one of their brand new games. You can play Battleship, Blackjack, throw at traditional targets, or even upload your own images. They are now accepting group and family reservations for this fall. Can't make it out before school is back in session? Not to worry. The Adventure Park is open Friday through Sunday every weekend this fall. To end the summer right, listeners of this show can now get $10 off any ticket by entering the promo code kime 23 dc at checkout. That's KIME, K-E-I-M, 23 DC at checkout. There is still time to get outside and join the adventure at theadventurepark.com. So we were talking, talking about this yesterday about you just seem faster out there. How much different do you feel knowing the system, knowing everything now? Oh man, I feel so much different, man. I, like, like I said, the game has slowed down so much for me, you know. Um, I played everywhere at this point. I played dime, I played backer, I played nickel, I played safety. So, um, you know, I know where my hope is, wherever, wherever I'm playing. And so it's made the game so much easier. You know, I could play more aggressive on certain things and I can sit on things because I know I've either got help outside or help over the top or help inside. So slow down a lot. So you had to fight so hard to get it to the roster last year after camp. Mm -hmm. You make the all pro team. Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel like you made it? Like I know, you, I know, yeah, right. And I, but I think I know you well enough to mm -hmm. know what the answer would be. What, what would you, what do you think? Nah, you can't. I, the, the, moment, the, the moment you feel like you arrive is the moment that you, you lose that, that, that flame that, you know, has inspired you. Um, all pro was great. You know, that was an accomplishment that not a lot of people get in their career, right? Um, and my position is two every year. And that was awesome. But at the end of the day, you know, this is a new year and I'm coming and fighting for a job at the end of the day. 
So as, as great as that was last year, if I come into it like, oh, I'm all pro, I'm this and that, it's, you know, they bring young guys in. Every, at the end of the day, the business is they bring guys in to replace you, right? right? And so that complacent mindset and just getting, you know, feeling like you're comfortable where you're at is how you get replaced, 100%. So now, it was great, you know. I know what I'm capable of, which I've always known at the same time. But, you know, now it's just like, OK, what am I going to do this year to be better than I was last year? So you, one of the big things, too, and I talked about this before, like mm-hmm. the leadership in the secondary. Right. Guys like you, Kendall, mm-hmm. and all that. how important is that? And like you, I, you talked to Quan after right. the game Friday, right? Mm-hmm. So how important is that? It's, it's, it's super important, right? I came in as a rookie and I was blessed to have, you know, the Malcolm Jenkins, the Rodney McLeods when I was in Philly, right? True veteran guys that really showed me how to, you know, make it in the league, right? And then I, I come here and I start developing relationships and it's Fabian Morrow at the time. And I had, you know, um, Darby was here, K. Fool. You know, those guys kind of mentioned me. So now, like, when these guys come in, now I'm kind of the guy that's been in the system for, you know, five, six years. So I know it, right? And so I can help it slow down for them, you know, and teach them how to be pros and, and not only tell them, but go show them, you know, this is how I go about my day every day. This is what I do. I come in at 650. You know, I'm coming and getting in the cold tub, hot tub, you know, getting stretched. You know, this is how you be a pro. Um, and I've been forced, fortunate enough to get that. So now just giving that back to them, that's how they start developing. So when they're older, they do the same. And, so, and it's funny because people always think leadership is rah, rah, yelling and all yeah, that. It's, no. it's, it's more, to me, it's always been about how are you approaching your job. Right, that but was right. the other thing, though, is the experience. So when mm-hmm. Quan has, like, listen, not every player was bad. Right, right. But right. he had a couple that stood out that people right. pick on. Mm-hmm. He's the first year, first time playing his game. Right. So what do you talk to him about after that game? I'm like, I'm like, dude, listen, man, it's your first NFL game. I understand. We've all, every person that's played sports ever in their life in their first big game, you know, preseason or not, you know, this is a milestone for any guy, any guy that's at this level. Um, just let it slow down for you, man. It's going to be fast. At first, there's going to be a lot going on, man. And that's okay. You know, that's normal. You're young. You're rookie. You're seeing a lot. Um, but just settle in, man. Just settle in. And just remember, at the end of the day, man, it's football. Like, at any level, it's a football game. How much do you think that, when, you, when you're a young kid, hearing that? And I, know it's, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you know what it's been like. Right. Does that, how much does that help? That, it helps a lot because, at that point, you stop, you stop trying to be perfect. You know, and that's the hardest thing is, like, you want to play – perfect and that's not reality in this business right you're gonna have times where things don't go your way and it's been building that mental callus throughout the process like okay this wasn't great next play all right what's going on now because you mean in this game if you can't get over that hump if they're gonna come back to you that's how it works um i experienced it in carolina in 2020 you know like i I struggled that game and they just kept chipping away um and so what i told him was like man like after that game i've you know, I, you would have thought I was the worst person ever, or worst player ever, you know. But I continued to just come in here and I worked. Or I worked at what I needed to get better. Okay, this is what happened. This is what I'm going to get better at. And that Seattle and that Philly and that Dallas game, you know, it was better, right? So um, that's the mentality that, you know, you got to create in these young guys because it, it helps them in the long run, right? I am always, I'm always guess too, like, players probably look to see how the players respond. Because mm-hmm. that's the whole thing in this league is yeah. how do you respond to good or bad? Right, 1,000%. Like, you have to. You have to be able to respond because it's got to be like it's always said next play mentality, but like man, that excuse my language, that shit's real. Yeah. Like the the, the game happens fast. Nobody's gonna wait for you to get over that play that you feel bad about, right? Usually it, the way it works is like the ball's gonna come right around you at, right after that play. Um, and so you gotta be able to have that mental fortitude and that callus, which he does. You know, he's a type of player. He reminds me a lot of myself when I was younger. You know, just that mental toughness of like. Man, I don't care what's going on on the outside. Like, you know, I'm motivated. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to get better. And uh, I'm going to show you, right? And so that's who he is. And so, but that's a huge part of it. And that's that's 90% of the game. All that, the physical shit's not there. I've told you this years and years. Like, the mental side of it is when you win. It's huge. It's when you win. I think it's an underrated underrated part of it. How about, like, fours? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you got the east skip. We all know that. He goes up and makes the hit. Mm -hmm. What's been your early impressions of fours? Confidence. I mean, he's, so, he's sure of himself, and when you're sure of yourself, you can play fast. You can play a certain brand of football. Um, I was never worried about him tackling anybody. You know, they get, you get caught up on the knacks of 
size, right? They said I was too small to play safety. Yeah. You know, I'm not I'm not the Derwin James. I'm not even Cam size, right? <laughs> but that don't stop me from playing fast. I'm right. going to hitting right. somebody. Um, so, and that size stuff, that's, you get caught off in all the analytics of that crap, man. Like, at the end of the day, he's a football player. He knows how to play around his size. Like, to me, it's always right. like, if you're small, you're short, you're quick, you're not fast. Right. How do you maximize what you can do? And right. That's what he does. You have to be good at something, and he right. is. You know, he understands leverages. He understands, okay, if I got a bigger guy, this is how I got to tackle this guy. Right. I got to get down quick, and I got to get him before he gets going. Right. right. He understands that. And when you understand that, man, it doesn't matter how big somebody is, right? You can still play that certain brand of football. He's good at that. He's very good at that. He knows himself. A couple, couple more. This mm-hmm. seems like one of the smarter secondaries that has been through here. Yeah. Do you, like, just from the outside mm-hmm. looking in, like, yeah. is that, do you think that's accurate? Yeah. I mean, we got guys, like I, like I said, I played Don Becker, Nickel here. Cam has played all of those positions. Percy is now learning all those positions. Kwan is coming as Ricky and is playing all those positions. You know, Defoe has shuffled around. They got him working, Don, backer, nickel, everything. You know, so you got guys, you got five, six, seven guys just in our room that can play everywhere. Right. Um, and so, like, when you understand that as, a, like, the defense as an entirety, you can really plug guys and be like, okay, we want to run eight guys out here. And they can all tackle. They all understand run fits. They all understand pass concepts. And so when you have that, like, it allows you to be more flexible as a coordinator. Like, you can show whatever look you want to, and you got guys that can play everywhere. So, I mean, yeah, this is one of the most, you know, so I would definitely say one of the smartest rooms, yeah. if not the smartest that I've been in, as far as guys just really understanding the defense and ball in general, concepts, everything. Last thing, quarterback. You get the distinct view of the quarterbacks mm-hmm. when you were facing him. What has been your take on Sam so mm-hmm. far? Sam, he's young, you know, and he's learning. And what I will say, he's learned a lot very quickly. You know, what I will credit us in is that we've given him so many looks. You know, like we had one today where it looked like zero. We popped out and played two, you know. Really? So, like, we give him so many different looks to where, like, he's really getting a, a, a head start on the game before it even starts, you know. Like, he's getting those game day looks, you know, because – He's going to go against great safeties this year. Yeah. You got Buda Baker. Yeah. You know, you got Quandre Diggs. Yeah. You know, you got um, the guys over in Philly. You got, got Buff- Buffalo, Poyer, yeah. and Micah Hyde. Okay. Those are two of the best in the game. Yeah. You know, so he's going to go against some great safeties. So this looks that we're giving him now, the, the showing, and then popping out. And it's great for him because he's getting that he's getting that early experience. But he's looked great, man. I've, I've been really proud of, you know, the work that he's put in and, and the composure. That's the biggest thing yeah. he has, that composure. Cool. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Jeremy for joining me and thank you as always for tuning in. I'll be back on Tuesday morning, wrapping up the Commanders preseason game against the Baltimore Ravens with the voice of the Commanders, Bram Weinstein. So talk to you next time.